Good evening and welcome to Birkbank Science Week. My name is Nick Keefe, I'm the Executive Dean of the School of Science and it's my pleasure this evening to introduce Professor Mike Oxford. Before I tell you a bit about Mike and introduce him fully, I'll just do the commercial break for the rest of the week. On Thursday we have three talks from our colleagues in Earth and Planetary Sciences on what controls the Earth's long-term climate. So those begin in here from 5.30 on Thursday evening. Tomorrow evening, we have our second Rosalind Franklin Lecture. The Rosalind Franklin Lecture is for an eminent woman scientist in one of the areas that Birkbeck carries out science and to, to come from another institution to give us some input. And tomorrow, we're very pleased to welcome Professor Guy Scariff from the University of Oxford to talk about developmental cognitive neuroscience, which is a very big area of our research at Birkbeck. And that's in here at half past six tomorrow. Both those events can be booked from the Science Week website that I'm sure you've already been to. It is my pleasure this evening to introduce Professor Mike Oxford to talk on the source of human irrationality. Mike came to Birkbeck 12 years ago from the University of Cardiff where he was already an eminent psychologist and he came specifically to be head of department and he has run an amazingly su successful department with very high scores in the research assessment frameworks that we have, a very efficient department, very well run and in fact one of the top psychology departments in the country. But while do doing all this administration and organisation he hasn't let his research slip, he's also a very eminent researcher in, into how human thought, irrationality and decision making. So tonight Mike is going to explain why we are all irrational. <laughs> Thank you very much for being here. I, I try to manage to get some time for research, just not as much as I would like. Um, I'm going to start this off. And as you can see on the front slide, I have uh, three books. Um, the one on the right or left is obviously very, very well known, and as it says on it, a major bestseller. Uh, the other book, to the opposite side, The Knowledge Illusion by Steve Stone and Phil Fernback, um, is just about to come out, and I am absolutely convinced it's going to be a major bestseller as well. Uh, the book in the middle is by me that wasn't a bestseller, <laughs> but nonetheless, I think I'm beginning to get the idea here because perhaps I need a catchier title. That's probably what it is. So anyway, I'm going to begin by talking briefly about elements of Daniel Kahneman's book, um, Thinking Fast and Slow. Uh, his system one and system two distinction is something that I will dwell upon at great length. And the very last sentence of the talk will put into Steve Sloan and um, for the uh, Fernbank's book. So at that point, if you want to ask why I put up that book, other than it's by a friend of mine, that's the point at which it could become directly and immediately relevant. Okay, so we're talking about the source of human irrationality. Um, it would help briefly to get to the point about why what I think is rational. Okay, I mean, in the psychology of uh, human reasoning, for the last 60 years, we've regarded rational as being conformity to normative theories. In other words, theories about how you should reason from logic, from probability theory, and from decision theory. And over that last 60 odd years and or more, um, what we've seen is systematic deviations from those normative theories in people's behaviour in the laboratory tasks. So in logic, logic determines whether an inference is valid or not valid, and what you see in the experimental data is that people endorse valid inferences to different extents, so they have to endorse them all, and they're quite happy to endorse completely uh, non-valid inferences to different extents. And the different extent is important because there's systematic differences that occur here, they're not just random variation. Uh, in probability theory, um, there are a variety of laws that are violated regularly by people in laboratory tasks. 
So, for example, one law is that the probability of a conjunction of two events, like something being a Ford and being blue, cannot be greater than the probability of either of those two events. So, in this case, the smaller of those two is the probability of being a Ford, so the probability of being a blue Ford cannot be greater than the probability of being a Ford. People regularly judge the conjunction to be more probable than either of the conjuncts, and that is a uh, real um, irrational response. Decision theory, uh, again, the rules of decision theory are violated systematically in laboratory. So we have transitivity of preferences, so you prefer Fords to Citroens and Citroens to. Um, what's my car? <laughs> Oh, VW, there we go. Then you should prefer Fords to VWs, right? because it's transitive, I and mean, it should be transitive. But people violate the transitivity of preferences all the time. So there are all these systematic deviations from normative um, rationality. The question is how to explain those deviations. And Daniel Kahneman's distinction between System 1 and System 2 is pretty much to receive you within the um, psychology of reasoning about how we go about explaining these patterns of violations of normative theories in uh, the laboratory tasks that we run. And the idea is basically we have a very fast system one and that produces errors on many occasions and we have a rational, slower, more reflective system two that can correct those errors. So let's have a look at what these two systems look like. System 1 and System 2 have been distinguished along many lines, and the original distinction was actually made by Jonathan Evans back in the late, uh, late 70s, about 1978. Uh, it's been added to um, many times since, and uh, Daniel Kahneman has popularized it much more fully than anyone else in his uh, Thinking Fast and Slow book. But the kinds of distinctions that are intended between implicit and explicit cognition, belief-based versus logical and analytic, associative versus rule-based, intuitive versus reflective, and conscious versus unconscious. In other words, the kinds of um, responses that come out of the system one, you don't know where they come from. Essentially, they are an unconscious um, process. And we can think about these in some wonderful examples that Daniel Kahneman provided of system one in operation, if I just put the juxtaposition of two words on the screen like banana and vomit, then your system one goes into action. Okay? You will probably feel various feelings of disgust. You may even cons construct a little causal story to yourself but relating bananas to the vomiting. So there's some kind of causal story going on here. You might even contemplate the fact, well, it's rather unlikely to vomit if you eat bananas, I'd rather like bananas. So perhaps it is a relatively unlikely event. All of these things occur spontaneously just on reading those words. And this is a sort of system one automatic unconscious process. The results of which may become conscious, but generally what's going on, you don't know how you're doing this. It's just happening. System two is much more reflective, um, analytic, and uh, conscious, like counting backwards from 1037 and 9s. You have to pay attention to what you're doing. You're going to have to apply the rules of arithmetic to do this in your mind, and you know what, what you you know you're doing it, and you know when you, when you go wrong. We also see how system one and system two can interact on occasion. This is another classic task, uh, the bat and ball task. If I tell you the bat costs a dollar more than the ball, and together they cost one dollar ten, how much does the ball cost? I'm not going to ask you <laughs> that, um, because that would be a bit unfair, but almost everybody that's asked in the laboratory says ten cents. Okay. But that couldn't possibly be the case, because if the bat costs a dollar more than the ball, then the total cost would have to be $1.20. Okay, so the price of the ball has to be five cents. And it's only when you suddenly start engaging system one to realize that this is actually a little kind of simultaneous equation type problem when you've got to try and solve it, then you will solve that problem. But your system one is 
dying to say 10 cents. And it's only when you sit back and reflect that you realise that can't be right. So the system one, system two distinction is showing you immediately in that example that the system one that is responding automatically, it's unconscious, seems to be giving you the wrong answer. Right? And that needs to be corrected by your conscious um, system two. So that gives us this kind of received view of the way in which um, we explain these patterns of errors that we've been observing in the laboratory for the last 60 odd years. And what I want to do is question this view in this talk. Um, and by in doing so, I want to suggest that system one is actually rational. And there's lots of evidence that seems to indicate that the outputs of system one and the processes that are engaged in system one are indeed highly rational. Um, I'm going to do that by going through some evidence that seems to suggest this. I'm also going to go through some recent theorising that relates some of the behaviour observed in conscious verbal reasoning tasks in the laboratory that seem to show that we're rational, and some work in basic brain theory about the way in which people act in perception and action, and our theories of that. I'm going to suggest that what goes on in um, the unconscious inference in perception and action is like sampling or interrogating underlying models that we construct in system one, and that we do the same thing in conscious verbal reasoning, it's just that we're still not conscious of exactly what's going on at that system one level. We are not aware of the outputs, and we have to do things with those outputs, we don't know exactly what's going on and what we're doing it. I'm going to show how that I, those ideas can generalize to account for some other effects in other areas. And I'm then going to look briefly at where irrationality may spring from. It is not coming directly from system one. Where is it coming from? How could it be corrected? Okay, just a few light points. These are just to tease you a little bit about your intuitions. Because one of the things about System two is supposed to rely on working memory. This is something that goes on in working memory when we're doing this kind of counting backwards from you know, a large number and using an odd number or so, whatever. We are consciously doing this in our kind of working memory. The one thing that has been noted by Keith Stanovich and others is that working memory correlates highly with IQ, but it doesn't correlate with measures of rationality, like doing that bat and ball problem which has been included in something called the cognitive reflection test, which has been um, put forward by Fredericks and Kahneman as a good measure of rationality, it doesn't correlate with IQ very highly. It doesn't um, correlate with working memory capacity. Moreover, working memory is a highly limited uh, processor. In fact, up until a certain point in time, um, and still, still, the limitations on working memory have always been invoked to explain why we make errors, not why we don't make errors. So there seems to be some doubt whether the kind of system two operating with, with working memory is going to give us this kind of account of rational reason. There's also some uh, work showing that what the conscious system can do, the unconscious system can do it as well. There's some work by Hassim that was reviewed in um, Perspectives on Psychological Science. And essentially, if we have two systems, one would imagine they're functionally distinct, they're there to do different things. But what um, Hassim showed was in a variety of tasks, it appears that the unconscious mind can do pretty much the same as the conscious mind and vice versa. So why do we have these two functionally distinct systems, if that's the case? Um, basically, Hassim said, are these, can the, these two systems do exactly the same functions? And the answer was yes, it can, which is the title of the paper. So those are just some signals indicating that you know, there's something not necessarily completely right about this distinction. But perhaps one of the most interesting uh, pieces of evidence that show that perhaps um, system one is rational is the fact that one would imagine that System one, the older phylogenetically older system, would be something we shared with other animals, 
And if it's going to be the source of irrationality, one might imagine that those animals would display some kind of systematic irrationality. Where, in fact, if you look with other animals' decision making, it seems to be um, pretty rational. Uh, Manus Kachelnik at Oxford has done lots of work with starlings, showing that in their kinds of foraging behaviour, they seem to be pretty much re making decisions in accordance with um, the axioms of um, expected utility theory. So, in rational choice, one of those um, rules is attractive preferences. And starlings, when they're making choices, seem to uphold the transitivity of preferences. Another one is the independence of irrelevant alternatives. So, if you introduce an additional alternative um, to uh, the choice set, say you know that they prefer A to C, and you add in B, they'll still prefer A to C, even with this additional item put in the choice set. So, both those two. Um, axioms of expected utility theory seem to be respected by the humble starling. And people like Stanovich have explored possible reasons why this may be the case. Why is it, why should it be the case that animals are more rational than us? And the kind of explanations rely on perhaps we're more sensitive to context. Perhaps we use second order preferences and we use higher order utilities, symbolic utilities. Even if that's true, the conclusion is nonetheless the same that this system one, which seems to be shared with other animals, would appear to be capable, very capable of rationality. In other words, decision making in this context in accordance with a normative theory of how you should make those decisions. We move from just uh, animal decision making. One thing about this is all these are all these are um, perceptual motor tasks, and if you construct perceptual motor tasks with um, humans, you can also see perfectly rational or optimal performance um, in decision making tasks. Normally, when we present decisions to subjects in the laboratory, we present them as prospects. A prospect is simply a sum of money associated with a probability. So like 100 pounds of probability 0.5, and we might ask them, do you prefer that option, this prospect, or another prospect, say um, 200 pounds with a probability of 0.25. Now those two prospects should be endorsed equally because they have the same expected value. If you multiply the two numbers together, you get 50. Right? That is the expected value of each of those prospects and therefore they should be valued equally. People tend not to do that. They prefer usually the more certain option, um, regardless of the number, uh, not completely regardless of the value, but hardly. So there are definite errors when you present this in using just verbal prospects in the laboratory. But a way of, of constructing these tasks is to use perceptual motor tasks. And this is an example where essentially somebody sees a touch screen and there are three regions on the touch screen. And each of these regions are associated with a reward value or a, a, either a utility or a disutility. And people then point as fast as they can at the screen. Okay. So what they do, they learn their probabilities of being able to obtain a reward by trial and error. And of course, the, these overlaps between the circles can vary. So that the difficulty of um, obtaining a reward can, can vary as well. So they learn their probabilities of um, being able to succeed. Once you've done that, you can then present them with pictures of the regions as one prospect and a picture of the region as another prospect and say, which one would you prefer? And because they learned the probabilities of success, they can then multiply those by the utilities, it would be, and they tend to be almost optimal in this case. They always make the optimal selection. They earn the most amount of money that they could out of these contexts in choosing between these prospects when they learned in this perception of a way. So it seems that what people are doing is learning this at a kind of low level 
And once they've done that, then their decision making seems to be quite rational. And what this seems to indicate is there's a kind of perception and cognition gap. In other words, when you do this with these verbal prospects, just a sum of money and a probability, people make uh, errors. But when they're presented in this kind of perceptual motor way, where people learn their probabilities of being correct, then uh, people get it, seem to get it right. So Jarvstead et al, and that was joint work with a member of uh, this department, Marika Hahn, um, decided to see whether they could close that gap in an experimental procedure. And they used a similar kind of task to the trauma housing experiments, where they used different widths of bars, where they had to try and hit the bar in order to get a gain or reward. But they also did a slightly more cognitive task. So essentially this is um, learning their ability to add four numbers to within a certain tolerance. So plus or minus six or plus or minus 12 or whatever. Um, and they had to then do the task and actually say, okay, you've got a very limited time in order to add those numbers, give me the result, and they could see what their probability of being correct, what their tolerance would, would look like. So again, they were learning their probability of being able to do this within a given tolerance. And then they did these decision sets where they were again asked to choose between prospects, essentially, but they are presented in different ways. Either it's a width of the bar and a value of and some money, it's a tolerance and some money, or it's the classical verbal task where you're just presented with a sum of money and a probability. And in these tasks, again, people were optimal in all three. And it seemed that having this learning phase beforehand enable people to solve the classical task just as well as they could solve the other task. So it would appear that the perceptual cognition of that gap can be closed as long as people have some experience of learning what the relevant their personal probabilities actually are in these cases. So again, both examples give us some indication that people appear to be functioning logically once you can gauge part of system one. In other words, this unconscious learning of the probabilities seems to enable people to make optimal decisions. Another set of tasks that have been used um, to demonstrate the irrationality of system one are what's called logical intuitions. I mean, here I'm using logical in terms of covering both um, standard logic and probability theory. So, the standard base rate neglect task um, is where somebody is told what the base rates of people are in a particular um, population, a particular sample. So, they're told there are 50 women and there are 950 men. So, the base rate of being a woman is very low. And then they're told that here's a randomly selected individual. And in a conflict task, they're told that this person is 25 years old, or a writer who lives in Toronto, and he likes shopping and spends lots of money on clothes. I'm sorry about the stereotypical, kind of rather sexist version of his answer, but it is the task that's used um, in the literature. So I apologise for that, but it's not my fault. Um, no, you can I should use another example. I know. But this is the standard one. So there are no conflict situation, you're told two, the same two um, non-discriminatory uh, cues about being a writer and living in Toronto, but the only you're told he likes to play golf, golf and watch football. Now this is a no conflict case because it's consistent with the base rate. Okay, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't violate the base rate, it agrees with it. Whereas in this it's saying it conflicts with it because it's information saying this is a woman, but the base rate is in fact very low. So the question is, is this A a male or a female? And what they should do is go with the base rate, but quite often they ignore it completely. Now, the distinction between the conflict and no conflict situation is important because it marks a whole range of behavioural differences between uh, uh, people's responses. So compared to the no conflict condition, when they see the conflict condition, people's 
Uh, this leads to increases in people's reaction times. It leads to autonomic, more autonomic activity, in other words, what we call galvanic skill responses. It leads to more activation of brain regions associated with um, conflict detection, which is the um, anterior cingulate cortex, coordinate or whatever I don't think about. I know nothing about brains, so no doubt. Um, it also uh, leads to people to uh, inspect logically relevant parts of the problem, and it leads to increases in the ability to access semantic knowledge about intrusive responses. But people don't seem to have any conscious awareness of any of this going on. In other words, they seem to be able to detect there's a conflict, but they don't know they're doing this, and it happens even when they make the system one response. In other words, it happens when they go with the description and ignore the base frame. The conclusion seems to be that they must be unconsciously computing the normative response. Because otherwise, how would they detect there's a conflict? If this is about conflict detection, and they're doing, they're detecting there's some kind of conflict, unconsciously they're detecting a conflict. But the only conflict that's there is a conflict between what the normative response says you should do, and the response that's being made. And the response basically suggested by system one. So people seem to be detecting, at, in system one, this conflict. And it seems, therefore, that they are doing the rational calculation at that system one level. So it appears that they're unconsciously computing that normative response to detect the conflict. OK, so where, where have we got to? Um, but it seems like in animal decision making, human perceptual and motor decision making, logical intuitions, seems to show that this apparently phylogenetic the older system one is capable at least of being rational right? it can yield rational responses if it's engaged in perception motor decision making tasks through learning the probabilities unconsciously then our decision making seems relatively optimal so these are some very compelling examples that this underlying system one is not this kind of um, irrational system but it seems to be a pretty rational thing and one would hope perhaps that it would be because after all this is the system that probably guides our behavior most of the time most of the time we wander around the world acting as we want to without thinking about it very much nor do we think do animals think about what they're doing very much but the system that is responsible for their actions in the world seems to adapt them pretty well to making sensible decisions as they uh, move through the world. At a theoretical level, is there some more connectivity between these underlying theories of unconscious reasoning and reasoning at the conscious verbal level? Well, what I want to suggest is that uh, this system one should be quite closely related to the kind of theories that we have of unconscious of the unconscious inferences that Helmholtz said underpins perception and action. If that's true, and then we can show that there is some kind of relationship between what's going on in system one and these unconscious inferences, and does that if that then affects verbal reasoning as well, it may be that there are depending on similar underlying systems, rational systems. So, well, what's our best theory of the way these unconscious inferences work? Well, our best current account that we know is the Bayesian brain theory. Um, and according to the Bayesian brain theory, the brain is a prediction engine. Essentially, it's trying to predict the state of the world at any point in time. And essentially, it's doing that by attempting to predict the state of our sensory surfaces skin, essentially in vision, of course, the state of the, our, our retinas, and it's trying to um, do that in a very hierarchical way that's organized in the cortex in this manner. So at the highest level, um, the context suggests various hypotheses about, about what might be there in the world, and that generates predictions in a cascade, in a cascade down to the level of the actual sensory receptors. Um, 
for various levels of organisations. So as you go down this route here, you've got predictions for uh, very complex levels of organisation about objects moving. Further on down, you have bits of, of, of the animal being predicted, and then you have um, rather abstract shapes moving around. And at the very bottom level, within these sensory surfaces, you have what's called sensory surround units, and you're predicting the state of those. So each hypothesis about what's out there generates a series of predictions down this cascade. At the bottom level, it's making a prediction about what these sensory uh, surfaces are like. But of course, they may not be like that. And if they're not like that, then you end up with an error. In other words, you've got a prediction coming down, you've got the input coming in, and there's a difference between these two things. And that's called the prediction error. And in order to make inferences about what's there, that's all that this is about data compression as well. Prediction error is something that means the complexity of the computation is actually a lot simpler. And you feed that prediction error back up the system in order to um, adjust the probability that each of these hypotheses is true or false. So you have two hypotheses it's a cat or it's a dog, it's actually a cat, this is what the perceptual system is seeing. So the prediction error will feed back up and adjust your degree of belief in the fact that it's a cat to be higher and your degree of belief that it's a dog to be lower, given the evidence that you've seen. And that's the way in the Bayesian brain theory, roughly, very roughly, um, prediction works in order to work out what's out there in the world. But within this theory, there's a couple of ways in which um, we can minimize prediction error. That's what we want to do in making predictions. We want to minimize the errors in the, making the prediction in order to get to the actual right hypothesis about what's out there in the world. You can optimize in perception, or you can act to bring prediction and model into alignment. You can do something to make the prediction and the world come into alignment. And the way this works, and I'm going to go put a few equations on here, not many. Um, the way it works in the Bayesian brain theory is you wanted to calculate the value of an action. Okay. And you have a desired distribution and anticipated distributions. So if you see an object in the distance, you don't know whether it's a panther or a dog, then those are your two hypotheses about its identity. And what you desire is for it to be a dog, right? Because meeting panthers ain't good. <laughs> but you have two actions you could perform. You could go nearer, or you could run away. And so you could approach it, or you could avoid it. The anticipated distribution given you approach it, probably given our preferences, is going to be, oh, it's going to be more likely going to be a panther. Don't like that. If you avoid it, however, you're going to find out nothing. So your uncertainty is going to stay the same, which means you're going to be it's going to be 0.5 in both cases. You know, I can't say which it is. The probability it's, if it's a dog or it's a panther is both the same as 0.5. Now the value of the action is simply, and this is what all this little bit of math says, is that it's the the um, how similar these two, these distributions are, the anticipated to the desired distribution. You will act dependent on how similar the anticipated distribution is to the desired distribution. And that will give you a value. And that's how you calculate it here based on the probabilities of these it being either a pad or a dog, given your generic model. You can see quite easily, I think, which is more, most similar. I don't have to do the calculation. You can see that this is more dissimilar to that than that. Yeah, just looking at the distributions, it's pretty clear that this distribution is more similar. And if you run the calculation, you find that that is, in fact, the case. So the avoidance distribution here is more similar to the desired distribution. So this is this. Distance measure is called, call that lead distance at 0.78. But approaches, this is more dissimilar 
What does that suggest? Because the distribution that's most similar to the one on one has the um, greatest similarity that I avoid. So that's my behavior. It's predicting what you should do based on the similarities between these the two distri these distributions. So the point is you can actually quantify this. I think. You can actually put a value on it. The brain could be doing this calculation quite easily. It doesn't actually have to look at distributions. We can look at them and go, that's all similar, but we need a way of calculating that. This allows you to do that. The next move is to look at two possible um, strategies that the brain might use. Um, in exploring the world, in looking at the world. Because you can decompose this distance measure into two parts. This is something called entropy or information, something that's measured in bits. This is simply something called expected utility, simply a probability multiplied by utility, just like a prospect. You multiply the two together to get the expected value. Now, you can calculate the uncertainty. So the, the point about exploration is what you're trying to do is minimize your uncertainty about the world. You want to perform an action that's going to tell you something. Minimize your uncertainty about the state of the world. And your initial uncertainty uh, before you perform any action is simply one bit, because you don't know whether it's a dog or a panther. You're completely uncertain. And only approach can reduce this uncertainty. So I do this calculation again on the distribution given that you approach, it reduces your uncertainty. It goes down to 0.88. Now interestingly, that difference between your initial uncertainty and the uncertainty given you avoid, given your approach rather, is also exactly the same as the probability of the distance between them, which is 0.12. And this difference measure is called expected information gain. For exploitation, we're simply maximizing expected utility. So what we're trying to do is act so as that we act in a way that conforms with our preferences. Our preferences are not to encounter pan panthers, right? Countering dogs, good. Countering panthers, bad. Right? So if you, if you calculate expected utilities of these, the expected utility of the actual avoidance is zero. For approach, it's a big disutility. So you avoid the, uh, uh, the object you can see in the distance. So these two strategies come out of this, exploitation and exploration, and they can be differentially weighted. If your primary goal is to discover what's out there in the world, then you'll minimize uncertainty or minimize entropy. If your primary goal is to act in accordance with your preferences, then you'll maximize expected utility. And if these will, at different points of time, as you are going around the world, these will have different um, weightings. Okay, so these two strategies come out of the kind of Bayesian brain theory. This is all very low level stuff. This is all about um, you know, perceptual motor strategies for guiding our action in the world based on our models and the way the world works. These models make predictions for our sensory services, produces a prediction error. We can reduce that prediction error by moving in the world, acting in it, and that creates these two strategies of either minimizing an uncertainty, in other words, to find out about what's out there in the world, or acting in such a way that um, accords with our preferences. So, okay, if these are the rational strategies that come out from the Bayesian brain theory, do we see similar strategies ever in verbal reasoning? So when we're actually doing conscious verbal reasoning, do we access these kinds of lower level models in order to guide uh, our um, inquiry into the world? And it would appear that we do. Um, there's a task of verbal reasoning that is very, very uh, ancient, and it's probably one of the oldest reasoning tasks that have been used in the psychology of reasoning. It's called Weissen Selection Task. Peter Weston was in the psycholinguistics research unit over at UCL, as was um, Phil Johnson Laird and Jonathan Evans, who are two of the uh, other 
main uh, players in this area. And they both done work on waste and selection tasks. I think I did my first um, major paper on waste and selection tasks. And I think a lot of us are quite fed up with waste and selection tasks. But it's quite an interest, interesting and instructive task in this context because you can model it using exactly the same kinds of um, theories as emerged in the Bayesian brain theory. In this task, you're simply given a conditional rule that says if, for example, if you smoke, you'll get cancer. And then you're told about four people. These are represented on cards. You only know one piece of information. That's on one side of the card. So this person smokes, this person doesn't smoke, this person has cancer, this person does not have cancer. And you are asked which of those cards you want to turn over in order to determine whether the rule that says if you smoke then you get cancer is true or false. This is typically done with abstract material, but in this case I will illustrate this in a causal case. I'm not going to say much about this apart from the fact that um, you can model this calculating a value called information gain in exactly the same way as I showed that this can be calculated in exploration in the Bayesian brain theory. And effectively, it relies on di distinguishing between two different hypotheses. One is that there is a dependency here. In other words, yes, smoking does cause cancer. In other words, the probability of having cancer given you smoke is high. Versus an independence hypothesis, which is a sort of like foil hypothesis that says that that probability they're independent of each other. Smoking does not cause cancer. Probability is not does not rise if you're told that somebody smokes. It doesn't increase the probability that they have cancer. So you want to compare those two hypotheses, and you can do it in exactly the same way as we talked about earlier on. In other words, you want to maximise information gain. You want to make sure that you choose the cards that have the most chance to distinguish between those two probabilities. And you can calculate that, as I said, using the information again, which is equivalent to what we call value of distance. There are other tasks using exactly the same kinds of methodology that require the uh, exploitation strategy. So you can come up with what's called the object selection tasks when I tell you that if somebody is drinking beer, they must be over 18. Now, somebody who's enforcing that rule must assign a high utility to detecting people who are violating it. So they assign a high utility to finding people who are drinking beer but aren't um, over 18, in other words, they're underage. And again, you can show that the people's behaviour on that task can be predicted as maximising the expected utility. That's the same as exploitation. Now, back when uh, we were working on these um, tasks, we referred to this as disinterested inquiry when you're just trying to find out about the state of the world, which of these hypotheses is true or false. But it's the same basic strategy as exploration. Um, and interested inquiry, uh, when you actually have values that you associate with these outcomes, we call um, interested inquiry, and it's the same as exploitation. So it would appear that the same basic kinds of strategies that came out of this very low level perceptual motor kind of theory of the way the brain reads the world are observed in verbal reasoning. It seems that we have access to those kinds of models from the conscious level and that we use the information from those in order to um, reason about specific kinds of tasks, like the social tasks. So it seems that these generative models are available at both levels, system one and system two. Uh, and therefore, they actually can generalize to explain results at both levels. So can we actually generalize this approach to other kinds of tasks? How much time for questions? Five minutes.
Well, it can generalize to other accounts as well. This is uh, probably one of the best known kind of generative model. It's, uh, this is called a Bayesian net. And um, in conditional inference, there are a range of tasks that are being used and a range of effects that have been observed. One of these is called suppression effects, another of the scouting inferences. And if you present someone with these kinds of premises, if it rains, the pavements are wet, um, and you then ask them an AC inference, which is called a Fermi-Le consequent, you tell them the pavements are wet and ask them, did it rain? Almost invariably, people say, yes, it rained, probably rained. It's the best explanation that they can think of for why the pavements are wet. However, if you then present them with this premise as well, if the sprinklers are on the pavements are wet, then they endorse that inference far less. It's pretty obvious why, because what this premise says is that, well, there might be another cause of the wetness of the pavements. Right? Therefore, it's not indefinitely the case that it rained. It could have, the sprinklers could have been on. So they downgrade their, their um, endorsement of that inference. In causal inference, discounting inferences have been uh, investigated extensively, and these can be illustrated almost directly in the same way. If you're told both of these premises are, uh, are enforced, and then you're told that the pavements are wet, you're then asked to rate it rains. So how probable is it it rains? If you're then told that the sprinklers are on, and rate that again, you find that people now discount rain as the possible cause of wet pavements. So these ratings, the first rating is great and the second rating, the rating falls because we find this piece of information. And you can model both of these effects just using these simple um, generative models. So if you actually collect um, ratings from people about all of these parameters here, these um, what's called causal strengths, and then use that to predict their degree of um, endorsement of the various inferences, you can, there's a almost perfect uh, the very high correlation. And also you can predict um, the, the scouting game, um, inferences as well, such that you know, these probabilities come out in the task. So they break these, um, this invariably happens when you present people this kind of information. Logical intuitions can also be um, explained uh, relatively uh, straightforwardly as sampling from underlying distributions. So just to illustrate that here, um, in this case, you can see that if you have a small scale causal Bayes net where the gender predicts various of these features that we're seeing, like um, uh, playing golf or like you're watching football, then if these are very discriminatory about this person being a female, then even if the prior probability is very low, your posterior probability will rapidly um, become higher than the probability that it's the male. So you can, you can, with this kind of model, you don't need much information in order to um, violate the, uh, to commit the um, base rate neglect fallacy. But it's not a fallacy, it's basically just um, using this model. But why do people um, show conflict? Well, in the Bayesian brain account, probabilities are represented as probability distributions. And all I've done here is illustrate a few um, beta probability distributions uh, and show that the, the, how the mean and the precision of these rely on the various uh, parameters of the model. If we treat updating on these models, when we find out um, the various features of the model, we can see that there are degrees of belief, and this is a degree of belief that some is, uh, the person is female. Given the cues, this goes up. This distribution shifts. And the probability of being male shifts downwards. <coughs> the point about this is if we assume that people are sampling from this distribution in order to come up with a, an answer about whether there's conflict or not, then you can see that the probability of there being conflict is going to be a function 
of the mean and the precision of these prior distribution and the likelihoods. And this probability is just this grey area here. And if you look at this graph, this simply shows that the probability of detecting conflict varies as those means and precisions vary. Now that is actually a prediction that has been observed. So as the mean of the prior changes, then people have shown that the fallacy, the, the base rate of the fallacy decreases. And we're testing the uh, one based on precision. And this also generalizes to models of um, quantified statistical reasoning at the moment as well, what's been proposed by the Science Victoria. Okay, so what we've established is that um, system one appears to be rational. It relies on building unconscious generative models. And we can interrogate these models either by sampling or by um, just fixing some of the values of those variables and reading off the predictions. But we appear to have kind of imperfect access to these. We're not consciously available to us. Um, we have to interrogate them and look at the results. We can't actually go in there and we don't know what we're doing. We're not conscious, we don't have conscious access to them. So where did the source of error occur? Well, it seems that system two would be a good place to look. Um, when we're interrogating these models and the results come to mind, then they have to be stored away somewhere. We have to put them in working memory in some form. And that means we may exceed the, the capacity of working memory by trying to store too many of the results of those interrogations. And that may exceed the capacity of working memory. Moreover, language is an issue because we may think about these results in terms of language, but the models are continuously uh, valued. The, Language is not, language is discrete. And therefore, we have, to, we have to re encode the information that we're getting from these unconscious models um, in language. And we need that in order to um, communicate to ourselves and to others the results of our reasoning. And that might be called a source of error. And we can see where this can arise in looking at verbal probabilities. So we communicate our probabilities to each other using verbal expressions like possibly, likely, improbable. And it's, we're only going to communicate those successfully if we use these terms in the same way or we use them ourselves in the same way. So I, when I say possible on one occasion, I must mean the same when I say possible on the next occasion. Unfortunately, there's a very large literature showing that that's not true. Essentially, people the same person on different occasions will use a different verbal probability expression um, for the same probability. And also large between subject variation in the expressions that people use. And this is actually such a serious problem that it can result in miscommunication about topics like environmental risk. We try to communicate that. You may get the wrong message over because people are not interpreting you in the way you expect them to. It's also the case if you're interrogating some of these models, you have to store the records away. You may make too few interrogations. If I interrogated one of these models just by setting this to true and then reading off the probability of Q, that will come out as quite high. And I might store that away as record saying, well, okay, I've got one record saying P was true, Q is true. Is true. So that's all I do, then I might interpret that representation as meaning that P and Q is true, rather than the fact that actually what I'm looking at here is a conditional relationship between these two propositions. And within the reasoning literature, it's a very common misinterpretation for people to treat the conditionals like they were conjunctions. It's also the case that most of the reasoning tasks we've looked at over the last 60 odd years are all require individual reasoning. In other words, you are sitting there in your cubicle doing the task on your own. You're not talking to anybody else. Um, and most often that's fine, because most often you know, using the rational system to guide your behavior is, is okay. But when reasoning errors uh, are going to show up, 
they're going to show up in various occasions. They're going to show up when you don't accurately predict the world. You take the wrong action. Or they're going to be made obvious to others when you make a public commitment. Uh, and then others can question you. I mean, that's important for, for rationality because quite often the way we think as individuals may not necessarily be where rationality is seated. It may be that it's when you make public commitments and then ask to defend them that that's where kind of rationality is the space where rationality really lives. And that's good because language facilitates this. You make your reasoning public uh, with your individual reasoning. Others can correct it. In other words, once you've made your, your reasoning, the products of your reasoning process open to others to criticize, then you're in the process of trying to um, justify what you've just said. And this results in argumentation. Argumentation is the process of trying to persuade others that you're correct while they're querying whether you're right or wrong. And indeed, there's been a lot of recent results showing that argumentation in a more public context is more rational than individual reason. Okay, so where are we? System one would appear to be rational, and it seems to be based on the same underlying neural processes that are described in both brain theory. And this system two seems to have imperfect access to the models that are generated in system one. That imperfect access, the way we have to store some of the results and interrogating those models, can be the source of error. Um, and, but it can explain a whole variety of um, findings on suppression effects, discounting, uh, discounting influences, and logical intuitions. It would also seem that perhaps some of the later evolved components of the cognitive system, like working memory and language, can lead to errors. These are system two errors. But language can also lead to error correction by putting reasoning out there in the social domain. And as I said right at the beginning, I was going to get back to um, Steve Stoneman's book. The beauty about the, uh, the knowledge illusion, um, or if you saw the subtitle, it says, Why You Never Reason Alone. Uh, that's exactly the point, in the sense that reasoning is usually something that occurs in that social context involves other people and uh, involves defending our position in the public domain. We rarely defend our own views to ourselves um, unless we are hopefully as scientists, and philosophers or whatever attempting to just knock down our own positions as we should do if we are doing uh, our job correctly. But in most everyday settings which we're trying to investigate in uh, understanding everyday reasoning People are not uh, doing that for themselves. It's something that occurs in the context of uh, defending positions that you're committed to with other people. OK, I'll leave it there. Questions for Mike? Thank you. Um, Do you think this could extend to explain things like psychosis? Um, well, there have been uh, obvious attempts to account for um, various kinds of reasoning biases in various kinds of um, uh, uh, disorder, so, um, specifically things like um, schizophrenia, where you get some areas of um, quite disordered thought that occur um, in conditional reasoning, for example. Uh, a student of mine a few years ago did some work on not schizophrenia itself, but schizotyping, um, and was looking at conditional influence of this kind of suppression effects that I mentioned earlier on. And uh, what we found was quite interesting because in the suppression effect, you, um, if I give you not affirming the consequent, which I use as an example, but you use something like modus tones or modus tollens. Um, and if I use a rule like if I turn the key, the car starts. If I tell you that um, you know the, the petrol tank's empty, that should defeat your conclusion. Yeah, so another information about a potential defeater is a, the context. In other words, the context of the absence of defeat is the context in which the rule works. 
what we're able to show is that um, high schizotypy subjects uh, ignore the context. Okay? So their level of endorsement of their modus ponens, modus tollens, is exactly the same if you tell them about defeaters or not. They seem to ignore it. Uh, whereas for further consequent and denying the NC, those are cases that are vulnerable to alternative causes. If you tell them about alternative causes, that should suppress them, and they do. So they seem to be quite selective. In other words, they, they ignore the context, but they don't ignore the presence of other possible causes. And we try to explain that in terms of some old work by Cohen and Sermon Schreiber uh, back in 1992 on neural networks, where effectively they've shown that um, you could model things like the Stroop effect by, um, in, and the, the way in which schizophrenic um, subjects behave on the Stroop effect by having a set of nodes within the, the neural network that respond to context. And if you knock those out or you, you turn down the gain in those units, you, sh you saw the effects that you saw with schizophrenic patients. You can do the very simple model of what goes on in conditional inference using a very simple um, constraint satisfaction network and show the same kinds of, you use, do the same thing, and represent those um, units as context units and just turn down the gain you could almost perfectly mirror the performance of the highest schizotypic subject. So, yeah, yeah I think it's, it's, it's relevant. You, know, um, you can have models that, that, that implement the inferential process, and now those would be kind of system one models because you know, you're talking about you know, this is a game parameter, it's a systems parameter in a, in a neural network. Talking about, and then one imagines that they're they are modulated by neuromodulators of some form um, that are implicated in schizophrenia. Um, so, yeah, there are, there are some crossovers. Sorry, that was a rather long answer. Another question? Um, it might be a rather similar answer, but I'm thinking of Alzheimer's. Can you apply tests similar to these? Um, people with um, Alzheimer's and see how far they've progressed? Uh, I don't think there's any doubt that you could do that. Um, the, the question is, is what you would predict. I mean, because I, 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 I profess to earlier on to know little about brains. Um, I know so, my wife does, because she's a neuropsychologist up at the Royal Free. And, um, she was always telling me that the thing about Alzheimer's is, unfortunately, it says that there, was a, there was a typical pattern of development, but it tends to be quite diffuse in the sense that it doesn't necessarily attack the, the same areas. So it's, it's difficult to make precise predictions about what's going on, because it's not like schizophrenia, which seems to be a kind of specific kind of uh, brain chemical uh, problem. Uh, what happens with schizophrenia might be a little bit more complex. So you could certainly use these tasks to track the decline, as it were, in the reasoning ability. But I'm not sure whether it would help enormously. Um, but yeah. If there are no more questions... Uh, that's exhausted like my knowledge of schizophrenia. Um, so I'd, like to, yeah. I'd like to invite you to join us for a drink outside and Mike may take a few more questions then. Otherwise, I'd like to thank Mike